Have you ever noticed that you cannot find an example of a perfect family in the Bible? There are a lot of imperfect families mentioned, families that have a lot of problems, a lot of pain, a lot of drama. But you can't find a perfect family. For example, consider the families that are mentioned in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. We begin with the first family, Adam's family, and we know that after Adam and Eve chose to disobey God's one rule, sin entered into the world, and with sin came problems, came a lot of pain, came a lot of drama. And from that moment, every family has been affected. We see it in Adam's family that there was disagreements between he and his wife. And then the second sin that was mentioned in the Bible was murder. His own son, Cain, murdered his brother, Abel. And from there on, we see problems. You jump to the next family that's mentioned, and that is Noah's family. Although Noah faithfully served the Lord for over a hundred years, building the ark, after it was all done, Noah decided to go out and get drunk. It caused an embarrassment and a shame in his family. His sons saw what was going on. There was division and fighting, and ultimately there was a curse put upon one of his sons. Problems and pain. You look at Abraham's family. Abraham was known as a friend of God, the great man of faith. But yet his family had many, many problems. On two occasions that we know of, Abraham betrayed his wife. Then they couldn't have children. Abraham and Sarah, his wife, decided that it would be a good idea to have a child with another woman. And then that just uh, brought strife and difficulty all the way down between Ishmael and their son Isaac. And there was ultimately envy and jealousy that broke that family apart. You think about Lot. Lot was a godly man, but made a very bad choice. He decided to live in the city of Sodom, a very wicked city, a city that ultimately God destroyed. And along with the destruction of that city, we see the destruction of Lot's family. As they were fleeing for their life, they were told not to look back, but his wife looked back, and the Bible says she turned into a pillar of salt. God judged her immediately for her disobedience. After that, we see even Lot getting drunk and committing incense with his daughters. A lot of problems in that family. Then you look at Isaac. There was favoritism, deceit, lots of issues. Jacob's family, there was rape, murder, lies, immorality. All of these things plagued the families in the book of Genesis. And we're just talking about the first book. We don't have time to talk about Moses' family, David's family, Solomon's family, many other men that we would highlight and lift up and say, these are great men of faith, great men of God. They had problems within their family. Now the question is, why does the Bible highlight dysfunctional families instead of highlighting harmonious families, families that are getting along, families that are loving and kind and families that have no drama, or if there are problems and difficulties, they deal with it perfectly. Why is it that the Bible doesn't highlight them? Well, for one thing, families are not always harmonious. We don't always get along with each other. And the reason we don't always get along is because we are selfish sinners. Every single one of us has a tendency to be self-centered, wanting what we want. And by nature, we are sinners. We break God's law, we do what is wrong, and we pursue after the things that cause division 
and hurt and drama. And so you put a group of selfish sinners together in one house and you ask them to share their possessions. You ask them to share the most intimate parts of life and you have a recipe for a mess. In fact, the Bible talks about our nature and how it has a tendency to cause a lot of problems. In James chapter number four and verse number one, here James writes, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? He said this fighting, this bickering, this not getting along, where does it come from? It comes from our old sinful nature that we want what we want. And that will always cause conflict. First in the home, but it doesn't matter where it is in any relationship, when we are selfish and self-centered, there will be conflict that follows. Proverbs chapter number 13 and verse number 10. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. Pride, wanting what I want, thinking that I'm the most important. This brings contention and strife and difficulty. And all of these things take place within the family. We're selfish in the home. We're proud in the home. We won't apologize. We won't get things right. This is a continual problem that every family faces. And that is why the Bible does not portray a perfect family because there is no such thing as a perfect family. They do not exist. All families experience problems. All families have fights. All families have drama. It's a recurring problem within every home. Now, I do want you to understand this, that although the Bible does not portray a perfect family, it does teach us how to get along, how to forgive one another and show love, and it teaches us how to overcome the problems that we all face in life. The Word of God is very good at that, giving us principles and truths and, and commands that if we would follow them, we would get along much better. We would, when an argument arises, when a problem comes up and hurtful words are said, we'll know how to forgive and move on. And every family is going to face its challenges. We all have problems. That's what life is. But God gives us great principles on how to overcome them as a family unit. So the Word of God gives us a lot of insight. But there's a deeper purpose at work, especially in the family and the mess that we have in our family. There is a deeper work of God that he is wanting to accomplish, and that is his gracious plan to save selfish sinners and to transform them into his image. The Bible over and over again declares this. For example, Romans chapter number five and verse number eight. The Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This highlights the wonderful gospel message that God the Father sent his son Jesus Christ to this earth to die for our sin, for our selfishness, our pride, our, our unwillingness to get along, our bitterness and resentment that we harbor, all of those things Jesus Christ died for. He was buried and he rose again so that he could give us salvation, but then also bring about a transformation in our life. Change the way we think. If we change the way that we think, we change the way that we behave. Ephesians chapter number two and verse number 10. The Bible says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Here are those good works, doing what God desires for us to do, 
bringing harmony, bringing love, bringing peace back to the home. But for this to happen, you must, number one, be aware of your sinfulness. Recognize this. I have sinned against God. I've disobeyed God's law. That the reason there's conflict and there's problems in my life and problems in my home is because of sin. I'm not going to excuse it. I'm not going to overlook it. I will acknowledge that I am a sinner. But also there comes an acknowledgement that I cannot save myself. I can't do good works. It's not through religion or any religious practice. It is only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And believing and accepting that. Choosing to believe and trust the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we acknowledge and we choose to accept the Lord as our Savior, then afterwards, we're already re uh, redeemed, we're already proclaimed as saved, forgiven people. But then we see this, God wants to transform our life. And we allow him to do that by submitting ourselves to the Word of God. See, cleaning up the family mess begins with receiving God's gift of mercy. That is where it begins. We have to come to that place as individuals within our home. It doesn't matter if you're the dad, the mom, children, you're the aunts, the uncles, the grandma, the grandpa, whoever, whoever you are, and whatever role you play in your family. God's mercy is for you. And God's mercy can clean up the mess that sin has created in your life and in your home. It's not just enough to say, well, I have a desire to have family harmony. Oh, our desire, and we're working very hard at this to bring our family together that we would all get along, that there would be no fighting, no bickering, no division, no hatred, that uh, we would very much forgive every time there's an offense. We would speak those words, I love you, and we would show that compassion and that care for one another. It is good to have that desire. It's good to have that goal and that focus that we want family harmony. But I want you to remember, what your family needs the most is God's saving grace and God's sustaining mercy. That is what your family needs the most. You could have one of the best families in the village, in the neighborhood, in the community, where everybody would look at you and envy you. Say, well, they're getting along. They show love to one another. They're good to one another. We want a family like that. But my friend, if you die in your sin, then the Bible says that there is only judgment to come. God wants to save families. And he wants to save you from the curse and the judgment of your sin. That is the supreme desire of God. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. But then we also know that as we invite the Lord Jesus Christ into our heart and into our life, he doesn't just sit there idle. He doesn't sit there silent. He begins to work in us. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. He can radically change your family life. See, our sin will always make a mess. But God's mercy can repair the damage it caused. Let God clean up the mess in your family. Come receive his grace and trust in his sustaining mercy.